magic word Here in my secret kindergarten The world's best show for kids is starting The secret kindergarten radio show Use your ears and your imagination We're going to play, we're having fun Hello and welcome back to the Secret Kindergarten Radio Show. This is a show for you, young children of the world. Any of you out there, young children? Well, this show's for you. And I love this show because I get to play my tin whistle. So begins the secret kindergarten. And I've got something to share with you today. I'm feeling loved. Yes. And I feel loved when people appreciate me. And that makes me feel loved. When they let me share my thoughts, when they let me speak to them, when they let me speak my mind, and when they accept me, for who I am, I feel loved. And I just hope whoever's listening out there, young or old, that you feel loved too, at least sometimes. Because it's good when people appreciate you. And it's good when people let you share their thoughts. And that's what Revolution Radio is all about. Sharing your thoughts and being free to share your thoughts and use your words and speak them to the world. And I already feel like I'm talking too much. So we're going to play some music by Nancy Stewart from nancymusic.com. Bonjour, mon ami, bonjour. Bonjour, mon ami, bonjour. Bonjour, mon ami, bonjour, mon ami. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. Veux-tu venir avec moi? Veux-tu venir avec moi? Veux-tu Ha! 
castle, there is clapping all around. There is clapping in the castle, mirth and merriment abound. There is jumping with the jesters, there is jumping all around. There is jumping with the jesters, mirth and merriment abound. There is twirling in the towers, there is twirling all around. There is twirling in the towers, mirth and merriment abound. There is dancing on the drawbridge, there is dancing all around. There is dancing on the drawbridge, mirth and merriment abound. Light the candles, start the music, lords and ladies, one and all. With our song and dance and laughter, we will fill the castle walls. With our song and dance and laughter, we will fill the castle walls. Every birdie has a song to sing. Every birdie has a song to sing. You hear it singing all day long, for a birdie has to sing a song. Every birdie has a song to sing. And every baby has a song to sing. Every baby has a song to sing. And though it won't have any words, it's the sweetest song you've ever heard. Every baby has a song to sing. Every mother has a song to sing. Every mother has a song to sing. A song for singing when it's light and a lullaby to sing at night. Every mother has a song to sing. Every daddy has a song to sing. Every daddy has a song to sing. You hear him holler out a song or humming quietly along. Every daddy has a song to sing. Every grandma has a song to sing. Every grandma has a song to sing. When she sings her song to you, then it becomes your song too. Every grandma has a song to sing. Every grandpa has a song to sing. Every grandpa has a song to sing. A song of happiness or strife, a song he's carried all his life. Every grandpa has a song to sing. Everybody has a song to sing. Everybody has a song to sing. And when we're singing the same song, you know we just can't do it wrong. Everybody has a song to sing. And when we're singing the same song, you know we just can't do it wrong. Everybody has a song to sing. Everybody has a song to sing. Oh, and it's that magic special card time. <laughs> it's tarot card time. And what in the world is a tarot card? Well, it's tarot cards they're magic cards and I recommend you get some and you can play with them and you can look at the pictures that's it and today the card I pulled the lovers <laughs> good thing I'm feeling love today and that's maybe that's why I pulled the card or maybe I pulled the card and that's why I feel loved but from my influence of the Angels Tarot deck, not my, I didn't make it, just the one I own. <laughs> it 
says, may you gain a greater understanding of your personal values by examining the choices you have made. What does that mean? Well, it's about your relationship with the world, how you make sense of it, and your sense of belonging to the world, to your family, to your community. You young children out there, you get that through play and exploration with others. So make sure you play today. That's the solution to everything for you kids. Play, 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 play. And pulling the corresponding card from the Whimsical Tarot by Dorothy Morrison. Corresponds to a fairy tale. And that fairy tale is Beauty and the Beast. Do you know that story? I think there's a movie of that out there. Well, I'm not going to explain it because I have the story right here. Now it is 36 minutes long, so we're going to play it. We're going to go straight into it now. We're going to play some and we'll go into the ad break and we're going to come back and we'll finish the story. So check it out. Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast by Madame Dolnois. There was once a very rich merchant who had six children, three boys and three girls. As he was himself a man of great sense, he spared no expense for their education. The three daughters were all handsome, but particularly the youngest. Indeed, she was so very beautiful that in her childhood everyone called her the little beauty. And being equally lovely when she was grown up, nobody called her by any other name, which made her sisters very jealous of her. This youngest daughter was not only more handsome than her sisters, but also was better tempered. The two eldest were vain of their wealth and position. They gave themselves a thousand heirs and refused to visit other merchants' daughters nor would they condescend to be seen except with persons of quality. They went every day to balls, plays and public walks, and always made game of their youngest sister for spending her time in reading or other useful employments. As it was well known that these young ladies would have large fortunes, many great merchants wished to get them for wives. But the two eldest always answered that for their parts they had no thoughts of marrying anyone below a duke or an earl at least. Beauty had quite as many offers as her sisters, but she always answered with the greatest civility that thought she was much obliged to her lovers. She would rather live some years longer with her father, as she thought herself too young to marry. It happened that, by some unlucky accident, the merchant suddenly lost all his fortune, and had nothing left but a small cottage in the country. Upon these, he said to his daughters, while the tears ran down his cheeks, My children, we must now go and dwell in the cottage, and try to get a living by labor, for we have no other means of support. The two eldest replied that they did not know how to work, and would not leave town, for they had lovers enough who would be glad to marry them, though they had no longer any fortune. But in these they were mistaken. For when the lovers heard what had happened, they said, The girls were so proud and ill-tempered, that all we wanted was their fortune. We are not sorry at all to see their pride brought down. Let them show off their airs to their cows and sheep. But everybody pitied poor Beauty, because she was so sweet-tempered and kind to all, and several gentlemen offered to marry her, though she had not a penny. 
but Beauty still refused, and said she could not think of leaving her poor father in this trouble. At first Beauty could not help sometimes crying in secret for the hardships she was now obliged to suffer. But in a very short time she said to herself, All the crying in the world will do me no good, so I will try to be happy without a fortune. When they had removed to their cottage, the merchant and his three sons employed themselves in ploughing and sowing the fields and working in the garden. Beauty also did her part, for she rose by four o'clock every morning, lighted the fires, cleaned the house, and got ready the breakfast for the whole family. At first she found all this very hard, but she soon grew quite used to it, and thought it no hardship. Indeed, the work greatly benefited her health. When she had done, she used to amuse herself with reading, playing her music, or singing while she spun. But her two sisters were at a loss what to do to pass the time away. They had their breakfast in bed, and did not rise till ten o'clock. Then they commonly walked out, but always found themselves very soon tired, when they would often sit down under a shady tree and grieve for the loss of their carriage and fine clothes, and say to each other, What a mean-spirited, poor, stupid creature our young sister is! To be so content to within this low way of life. But their father thought differently, and loved and admired his youngest child more than ever. After they had lived in this manner about a year, the merchant received a letter which informed him that one of his richest ships, which he thought was lost, had just come unto port. This news made the two eldest sisters almost mad with joy, for they thought they should now leave the cottage and have all their finery again. When they found that their father must take a journey to the ship, the two eldest begged that he would not fail to bring them back some new gowns, caps, rings, and all sorts of trinkets. But Beauty asked for nothing for she thought that all the ship was worth would hardly buy everything her sisters wished for. Beauty, said the merchant, how comes it that you ask for nothing? What can I bring you, my child? Since you are so kind as to think of me, dear father, she answered, I should be glad if you would bring me a rose, for we have none in our garden. Now Beauty did not indeed wish for a rose, nor anything else, but she only said this, that she might not affront her sisters, otherwise they would have said she wanted her father to praise her for desiring nothing. The merchant took his leave of them and set out to do his journey, but when he got to the ship, some persons went to law with him about the cargo and after a deal of trouble he came back to his cottage as poor as he had left it. When he was within thirty miles of his home, and thinking of the joy of again meeting his children, he lost his way in the midst of a dense forest. It rained and snowed very hard, and, besides, the wind was so high as to throw him twice from his horse. Night came on, and he feared he should die of cold and hunger, or be torn to pieces by the wolves that he heard howling round him. All at once he cast his eyes toward the long avenue, and so, at the end, a light, but it seemed a great way off. He made the best of his way toward it, and found that it came from a splendid palace the windows of which were all blazing with light. It had great bronze gates, standing wide open, and fine courtyards through which the merchant passed, but not a living soul was to be seen. There were stables, too, 
which his poor, starved horse, less scrupulous than himself, entered at once, and took a good meal of oats and hay. His master then tied him up and walked towards the entrance hall, but still without seeing a single creature. He went on to a large dining parlor, where he found a good fire and table covered with some very nice dishes, but only one plate with a knife and fork. As the snow and rain had wetted him to the skin, he went up to the fire to dry himself. I hope, said he, that the master of this house or his servants will excuse me, for it surely will not be long now before I see them. He waited some time, but still nobody came. At last the clock struck eleven, and the merchant, being quite faint for the want of food, helped himself to a chicken and to a few glasses of wine, yet all the time trembling with fear. He sat till the clock struck twelve, and then, taking courage, began to think he might as well look about him, so he opened the door at the end of the hall and went through it into a very grand room, in which there was a fine bed, and as he was feeling very weary, he shut the door, took off his clothes, and got into it. It was ten o'clock in the morning before he awoke. When he was amazed to see a handsome new suit of clothes led ready for him, instead of his own, which were all torn and spoiled. To be sure, said he to himself, this place belongs to some good fairy who has taken pity on my ill luck. He looked out of the window, and instead of the snow-covered wood, where he had lost himself the previous night, he saw the most charming arbors, covered with all kinds of flowers. Returning to the hall where he had supper, he found a breakfast table, ready prepared. Indeed, my good fairy, said the merchant aloud, I am vastly obliged to you for your kind care of me. He then made a hearty breakfast, took his hat, and was going to the stable to pay his horse a visit, but as he passed under one of the arbors, which was loaded with roses, he thought of what beauty had asked him to bring back to her, and so he took a bunch of roses to carry home. At the same moment he heard a loud noise and saw coming toward him a beast, so frightful to look at that he was ready to faint with fear. "'Ungrateful man,' said the beast in a terrible voice, "'I have saved your life by admitting you into my palace, and in return you steal my roses, which I value more than anything I possess. But you shall atone for your fault. Die in a quarter of an hour.' The merchant fell on his knees, and clapping his hands, said, "'Sir, I humbly beg your pardon. I did not think it would offend you to gather a rose for one of my daughters who had entreated me to bring her one home. Do not kill me, my lord.' "'I am not a lord, but a beast,' replied the monster. "'I hate false compliments, so do not fancy that you can coax me by any such ways. You tell me that you have daughters.' Now, I will suffer you to escape if one of them will come and die in your stead. If not, profuse that you will yourself return in three months to be dealt with as I may choose. The tender-hearted merchant had no thoughts of letting any one of his daughters die for his sake, but he knew that if he seemed to accept the beast's terms, he should at least have the pleasure of seeing them once again. So he gave his promise, and was told that he might then set off as soon as he liked. But, said the beast, I do not wish you to go back empty-handed. Go to the room you slept in, and you will find a chest there. Fill it with whatsoever you like best, and I will have it taken to your own house for you. When the beast had said this, he went away. The good merchant, left to himself, began to consider that, as he must die, 
for he had no thought of breaking a promise, made even to a beast, he might as well have the comfort of leaving his children provided for. He returned to the room he had slept in and found there heaps of gold pieces lying about. He filled the chest with them to the very brim, locked it, and mounting his horse, left the palace as sorrowful as he had been glad when he first beheld it. The horse took a path across the forest of his own accord, and in a few hours they reached the merchant's house. His children came running round him, but instead of kissing them with joy, he could not help weeping as he looked at them. He held in his hand the bunch of roses which he gave to Beauty, saying, Take this roses, Beauty, but little do you think how dear they have cost your poor father. And then he gave them an account of all that he had seen or heard in the palace of the beast. The two eldest sisters now began to shed tears and to lay the blame upon Beauty, who, they said, would be the cause of her father's death. See, said they, what happens from the pride of the little wretch. Why did not she ask for such things as we did? But, to be sure, Miss must not be like other people, and though she will be the cause of her father's death, yet she does not shed a tear. It would be useless, replied Beauty, for my father shall not die. As the beast will accept one of his daughters, I will give myself up and be only too happy to prove my love for the best of fathers. No, sisters, said the three brothers with one voice. That cannot be. We will go in search of this monster, and either he or we will perish. Do not hope to kill him, said the merchant. His power is far too great. But beauty's young life shall not be sacrificed. I am old, and I cannot expect to live much longer, so I shall but give up a few years of my life, and shall only grieve for the sake of my children. Never, father, cried beauty. If you go back to the palace, you cannot hinder my going after you. Though young, I am not over-fond of life, and I would much rather be eaten up by the monster than die of grief for your loss. The merchant in vain tried to reason with Beauty, who still obstinately kept to her purpose, which in truth made her two sisters glad, for they were jealous of her because everybody loved her. The merchant was so grieved at the thoughts of losing his child that he never once thought of the chest filled with gold. But at night, to his great surprise, he found it standing by his bedside. He said nothing about his riches to his eldest daughters, for he knew very well it would at once make them want to return to town. But he told Beauty his secret, and she then said that while he was away, two gentlemen had been on a visit at her cottage, who had fallen in love with her two sisters. She entreated her father to marry them without delay, for she was so sweet-natured she only wished them to be happy. Three months went by only too fast, and then the merchant in beauty got ready to set out for the palace of the beast. Upon these, the two sisters rubbed their eyes with an onion to make believe they were crying. Both the merchant and his sons cried in earnest. Only Beauty shed no tears. They reached the palace in a very few hours, and the horse, without bidding, went into the stable as before. The merchant and Beauty walked toward the large hall, where they found a table covered with every dainty and two plates laid already. The merchant had very little appetite, but Beauty, that she might the better hide her grief, placed herself at the table and helped her father. She then began to eat herself, and thought all the time that, to be sure, the beast had a mind to fatten her before he ate her up, since he had provided such good cheer for her. When they had done their supper, they heard a great noise. 
and the good old man began to bid his poor child farewell, for he knew it was the beast coming to them. When Beauty first saw the frightful form, she was very much terrified, but tried to hide her fear. The creature walked up to her and eyed her all over, then asked her in a dreadful voice if she had come quite of her own accord. Yes, said Beauty, then you are a good girl, and I am very much obliged to you. This was such an astonishingly civil answer that Beauty's courage rose. But it sank again when the beast, addressing the merchant, desired him to leave the palace next morning and never return to it again. And so good night, merchant, and good night, Beauty. Good night, beast, she answered, as the monster shuffled out of the room. Oh, my dear child, said the merchant, kissing his daughter, I am half dead already at the thought of leaving you with this dreadful beast. You shall go back and let me stay in your place. No, said Beauty boldly, I will never agree to that. You must go home tomorrow morning. They then wished each other good night and went to bed, both of them thinking they should not be able to close their eyes. But as soon as ever they had lain down, they fell into a deep sleep and did not awake till morning. Beauty dreamed that a lady came up to her, who said, I am very much pleased, Beauty, with the goodness you have shown, in being willing to give your life to save that of your father. Do not be afraid of anything, you shall not go without a reward. As soon as Beauty awoke, she told her father this dream. But though he gave him some comfort, he was a long time before he could be persuaded to leave the palace. At last, Beauty succeeded in getting him safely away. When her father was out of sight, poor Beauty began to weep sorely. Still, having naturally courageous spirit, she soon resolved not to make her sad case still worse by sorrow, which she knew was vain, but to wait and be patient. She walked about to take a view of all the palace, and the elegance of every part of it much charmed her. But what was her surprise when she came to a door on which was written Beauty's Room? She opened it in haste, and her eyes were dazzled by the splendor and taste of the apartment. What made her wonder more than all the rest was a large library filled with books, a harpsichord, and many pieces of music. The beast surely does not mean to eat me up immediately, said she, since he takes care I shall not be a, a loss how to amuse myself. She opened the library and saw these verses written in letters of gold in the back of one of the books. Beauteous lady, dry your tears. Here's no cause for sighs or fears. Command as freely as you may, for your command and I obey. Alas, said she, sighing, I wish I could only command a sight of my poor father and to know what he is doing at this moment. Just then, by chance, she cast her eyes upon a looking-glass that stood near her, and in it she saw a picture of her old home and her father riding mournfully up to the door. Her sisters came out to meet him, and although they tried to look sorry, it was easy to see that in their hearts though they were very glad. In a short time all this picture disappeared, but it caused Beauty to think that the beast, besides being very powerful, was also very kind. About the middle of the day, she found a table laid ready for her, and a sweet concert of music played all the time she was dining, without her seeing anybody. But at supper, when she was going to seat herself at the table, she heard the noise of the beast, and could not help trembling with fear. Beauty, said he, will you give me leave to see you sub? That is as you please, answered she, very much afraid. Not in the least, said the beast. 
you alone command in this place. If you should not like my company, you need only say so, and I will leave you that moment. But tell me, beauty, do you not think me very ugly? Why, yes, said she, for I cannot tell a falsehood. But then I think you are very good. Am I? sadly replied the beast. Yet, besides being ugly, I am also very stupid. I know well enough that I am but a beast. Very stupid people, said Beauty, are never aware of it themselves. At which kindly speech the beast looked pleased, and replied, not without an awkward sort of politeness, Pray, do not let me detain you from supper, and be sure that you are well served. All you see is your own, and I should be deeply grieved if you want it for anything. You are very kind, so kind that I almost forgot you are so ugly, said Beauty earnestly. Ah, yes, answered the beast with a great sigh. I hope I am good-tempered, but still I am only a monster. There is many a monster who wears the form of a man. It is better of the two to have the heart of a man and the form of a monster. I would thank you, Beauty, for this speech, but I am too senseless to say anything that would please you, returned the beast in a melancholy voice. And altogether, he seemed so gentle and so unhappy that Beauty, who had the tenderest heart in the world, felt her fear of him gradually vanish. She ate her supper with a good appetite and conversed in her own sensible and charming way, till at last, when the beast rose to depart, he terrified her more than ever by saying abruptly in his gruff voice, Beauty, will you marry me? Now Beauty, frightened as she was, would speak only the exact truth. Besides, her father had told her that the beast liked only to have the truth spoken to him, so she answered in a very firm tone, No beast. He did not get into a passion or do anything, but sigh deeply and depart. When Beauty found herself alone, she began to feel pity for the poor beast. Oh, said she, what a sad thing it is that he should be so very frightful, since he is so good-tempered. Beauty lived three months in this palace, very well pleased. The beast came to see her every night, and talked with her, while she supped, and thought what he said was not very clever, yet, as she saw in him every day some new goodness, instead of dreading the time of his coming, she soon began continually looking at her watch to see if it were nine o'clock, for that was the hour when he never failed to visit her. One thing only vexed her, which was that every night before he went away he always made it a rule to ask her if she would be his wife, and seemed very much grieved at her steadfastly replying no. At last, one night she said to him, you wouldn't be greedy, beast, by forcing me to refuse you so often. I wish I could take such a liking to you as to agree to marry you. But I must tell you plainly that I do not think it will ever happen. I shall always be your friend, so try to let that content you. I must, sighed the beast, for I know well enough how frightful I am. But I love you better than myself. Yet I think I am very lucky in your being pleased to stay with me. Now I promise, Beauty, that you will never leave me. Beauty would almost have agreed to this, so sorry was she for him. But she had that day seen in her magic glass, which she looked at constantly, that her father was dying of grief for her sake. Alas, she said, I long so much to see my father, that if you do not give me leave to visit him, I shall break my heart. I would rather break mine, Beauty, answered the beast. I will send you to your father's cottage. You shall stay there, and your poor beast shall die of sorrow. No, said Beauty, crying, I love you too well to be the cause of your death. I promise to return in a week. You have shown me that my sisters are married, and my brothers are gone for soldiers, so that my father is left all alone. Let me stay a week with him. 
"'You shall find yourself with him to-morrow morning,' replied the beast. "'But mind, do not forget your promise. "'When you wish to return, you have nothing to do but to put your ring on a table where you go to bed. "'Good-bye, Beauty.' "'The beast sighed as he said these words, "'and Beauty went to bed very sorry to see him so much greet. "'When she awoke in the morning, she found herself in her father's cottage.' She rang a bell that was at her bedside, and a servant entered. But as soon as she saw Beauty, the woman gave a loud shriek, upon which the merchant ran upstairs, and when he beheld his daughter, he ran to her, and kissed her a hundred times. At last Beauty began to remember that she had brought no clothes with her to put on. But the servant told her, She had just found in the next room a large chest full of dresses, trimmed all over with gold and adorned with pearls and diamonds. Beauty, in her own mind, thanked the beast for his kindness and put on the plainest gown she could find among them all. She then desired the servant to lay the rest aside, for she intended to give them to her sisters. But as soon as she had spoken these words, The chest was gone out of sight in a moment. Her father then suggested perhaps the beast chose for her to keep them all for herself, and, as soon as he said this, they saw the chest standing again in the same place. While Beauty was dressing herself, a servant brought word to her that her sisters were to come with their husbands to pay her a visit. They both lived unhappily with the gentleman they had married. The husband of the eldest was very handsome, but was so proud of this that he thought of nothing else from morning till night, and did not care a pin for the beauty of his wife. The second had married a man of great learning, but he made no use of it, except to torment and affront all his friends, and his wife more than any of them. The two sisters were ready to burst with spite when they saw Beauty dressed like a princess, and looking so very charming. All the kindness that she showed them was of no use, for they were vexed more than ever when she told them how happy she lived at the palace of the beast. The spiteful creatures went by themselves into the garden, where they cried to think of her good fortune. "'Why should the little wretch be better off than we?' said they. We are much handsomer than she is. Sister, said the eldest, a thought has just come into my head. Let us try to keep her here longer than the week for which the beast gave her leave. And then he will be so angry that perhaps when she goes back to him he will eat her up in a moment. That is well thought of, answered the other, but To do this we must pretend to be very kind. They then went to join her in the cottage, where they showed her so much false love that beauty could not help crying for joy. When the week was ended, the two sisters began to pretend such grief at the thought of her leaving them that she agreed to stay a week more. But all that time, Beauty could not help fretting for the sorrow that she knew her absence would give her poor beast for she tenderly loved him, and much wished for his company again. Among all the grand and clever people she saw, she found nobody who was half so sensible, so affectionate, so thoughtful, or so kind. The tenth night of her being at the cottage, she dreamed she was in the garden of the palace, that the beast lay dying on a grass plot, and with his last breath put her in mind of her promise, and laid his death to her forsaking him. Beauty awoke in a great fright, and she burst into tears. "'Am I not wicked,' said she, "'to behave so ill to a beast who has shown me so much kindness? Why will I not marry him? I am sure I should be more happy with him than my sisters are with their husbands. He shall not be wretched any longer on my account, for I should do nothing but blame myself all the rest of my life.' She then rose, put a ring on the table, got into bed again, and soon fell asleep. In the morning, 
she with joy found herself in the palace of the beast. She dressed herself very carefully that she might please him the better, and thought she had never known a day pass away so slowly. At last the clock struck nine, but the beast did not come. Beauty, dreading lest she might truly have caused his death, ran from room to room calling out, Beast, dear beast! But there was no answer. At last she remembered her dream, rushed to the grass plot, and there saw him lying, apparently dead, beside the fountain. Forgetting all his ugliness, she threw herself upon his body, and finding his heart still beating, she fetched some water and sprinkled it over him, weeping and sobbing the while. The beast opened his eyes. You forgot your promise, beauty, and so I determined to die, for I could not live without you. I have starved myself to death, but I shall die content since I have seen your face once more. No, dear beast, cried beauty passionately, you shall not die, you shall live to be my husband. I thought it was only friendship I felt for you, but now I know it was love. The moment beauty has spoken these words, the palace was suddenly lighted up, and all kinds of rejoicing were heard around them, none of which she noticed, but hung over her dear beast with the utmost tenderness. At last, unable to restrain herself, she dropped her head over her hands, covered her eyes, and cried for joy, and when she looked up again, the beast was gone. In his stead she saw at her feet a handsome, graceful young prince, who thanked her with the tenderest expression for having freed him from enchantment. But where is my poor beast? I only want him and nobody else, sobbed beauty. I am he, replied the prince. A wicked fairy condemned me to this form, and forbade me to show that I had any wit or sense till a beautiful lady should consent to marry me. You alone, dearest beauty, judge me neither by my looks nor by my talents, but my heart alone. Take it then, and all that I have besides, for all is yours. Beauty, full of surprise but very happy, suffered the prince to lead her to his palace, where she found her father and sisters, who had been brought there by the fairy lady whom she had seen in a dream the first night she came. Beauty, said the fairy, you have chosen well, and you have your reward, for a true heart is better than either good looks or clever brains. As for you, ladies, and she turned to the two elder sisters, I know all your ill deeds, but I have no worse punishment for you than to see your sister happy. You shall stand as statues at the door of her palace, and when you repent of and have amended for your faults, you shall become women again. But to tell you the truth, I very much fear you will remain statues forever. And that was Beauty and the Beast. What's the moral of the story? <laughs> Go and marry the ugliest person you can find. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, isn't that, isn't that, didn't that end nicely? Because it was so sad. The whole, the whole story was so sad. And then it turned out to be quite nice. The beast turned into a prince. A handsome prince. We've just got time for one little song. So here we go. Shells from under the ocean, shells from under the sea. If you find a pretty shell, you can bring it home to me. Shells from the coast of Africa or from the Florida Keys. If you find a pretty shell, you can bring it home to me. Shells the color of a rainbow, or shells as white as can be. 
If you find a pretty shell, you can bring it home to me. Shells from under the ocean, shells from under the sea. If you find a pretty shell, you can bring it home to me. If you find a pretty shell, you can bring it home to me. And this is Gino from the Secret Kindergarten, and thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio, the number one listener-supported radio station in the world. So please help support our efforts and airtime by visiting the station's donation section on our website, revolution.radio. We are now up to Maya the Bee, The Adventures of Maya the Bee by Voldemort Bonsells. We are already up to chapter 5, and this one, this chapter is called The Acrobat. So let's just dive straight in, see what our friend Maya, the busy, exploring, adventurous bee, let's see what she gets up to next. Chapter 5 of Adventures of Maya the Bee The Adventures of Maya the Bee by Valdemar Bonsells Translated by Adele Zold Seltzer and Arthur Guterman. Chapter 5 The Acrobat. Oh, what a day! The dew had fallen early in the morning, and when the sun rose and cast its slanting beams across the forest of grass, there was such a sparkling and glistening and gleaming that you didn't know what to say or do for sheer ecstasy. It was so beautiful, so beautiful. The moment Maya awoke, glad sounds greeted her from all round. Some came out of the trees, from the throats of the birds, the dreaded creatures who could yet produce such exquisite song. Other happy calls came out of the air, from flying insects, or out of the grass and the bushes, from bugs and flies, big ones and little ones. Maya had made it very comfortable for herself in a hole in a tree, it was safe and dry, and stayed warm the greater part of the night because the sun shone on the entrance all day long. Once, early in the morning, she had heard a woodpecker rat-a-tat-tatting on the bark of the trunk, and had lost no time getting away. The drumming of a woodpecker is as terrifying to a little insect in the bark of a tree as the breaking open of our shutters by a burglar would be to us. But at night she was safe in her lofty nook, at night no creatures came prying. She had sealed up part of the entrance with wax, leaving just space enough to slip in and out, and in a cranny in the back of the hole, where it was dark and cool, she had stored a little honey against rainy days. This morning she swung herself out into the sunshine with a cry of delight, all anticipation as to what the fresh, lovely day might bring. She sailed straight through the golden air, "'looking like a brisk dot driven by the wind. "'I'm going to meet a human being today,' she cried. "'I feel sure I am. "'On days like this, human beings must certainly be out in the open air enjoying nature.' "'Never had she met so many insects. "'There was a coming and going and all sorts of doings. "'The air was alive with a humming and a laughing and glad little cries.' You had to join in. You just had to join in. After a while, Maya let herself down into a forest of grass, where all sorts of plants and flowers were growing. The highest were the white tufts of yarrow and butterfly weed, the flaming milkweed that drew you like a magnet. She took a sip of nectar from some clover, and was about to fly off again, when she saw a perfect droll of a beast perched on a blade of grass, curving above her flower. She was thoroughly scared. He was such a lean, green monster. But then her interest was tremendously aroused, and she remained sitting still, as though rooted to the spot, and stared straight at him. At first glance you'd have thought he had horns. Looking closer, you saw it was his oddly protuberant forehead that gave this impression. Two long, long feelers, fine as the finest thread, 
grew out of his brows, and his body was the slimmest imaginable, and green all over, even to his eyes. He had dainty forelegs and thin, inconspicuous wings that couldn't be very practical, Maya thought. Oddest of all were his great hind legs, which stuck up over his body like two jointed stilts. His sly, saucy expression was contradicted by the look of astonishment in his eyes, and you couldn't say there was any meanness in his eyes either. No, rather a lot of good humor. Well, mademoiselle, he said to Maya, evidently annoyed by her surprised expression, never seen a grasshopper before? Or are you laying eggs? The idea, cried Maya in shocked accents. It wouldn't occur to me. Even if I could, I wouldn't. It would be usurping the sacred duties of our queen. I wouldn't do such a foolish thing. The grasshopper ducked his head and made such a funny face that Maya had to laugh out loud in spite of her chagrin. Mademoiselle, he began, then had to laugh himself and said, You're a case, you're a case. The fellow's behavior made Maya impatient. Why do you laugh? she asked in a not altogether friendly tone. You can't be serious expecting me to lay eggs, especially out here on the grass. There was a snap. Hoppity hop, said the grasshopper, and was gone. Maya was utterly nonplussed. Without the help of his wings, he had swung himself up in the air in a tremendous curve. Foolhardiness bordering on madness, she thought. But there he was again, from where she couldn't tell. But there he was, beside her, on a leaf of her clover. He looked her up and down, all round, before and behind. No, he said then pertly, you certainly can't lay eggs. You're not equipped for it. You haven't got a borer. What? Borer? Maya covered herself with her wings and turned so that the stranger could see nothing but her face. Borer, that's what I said. Don't fall off your base, mademoiselle. You're a wasp, aren't you? To be called a wasp, nothing worse could happen to little Maya. I never, she cried. Hoppity hop, answered he, and was off again. The fellow makes me nervous, she thought, and decided to fly away. She couldn't remember ever having been so insulted in her life. What a disgrace to be mistaken for a wasp, one of those useless wasps, those tramps, those common thieves. It really was infuriating. But there he was again. Mademoiselle, he called, and turned round part way, so that his long hind legs looked like the hands of a clock, standing at five minutes before half past seven. Mademoiselle, you must excuse me for interrupting our conversation now and then. But suddenly I'm seized. I must hop. I can't help it. I must hop, no matter where. Can't you hop, too? He smiled a smile that drew his mouth from ear to ear. Maya couldn't help keep from laughing. Can you? said the grasshopper, and nodded encouragingly. Who are you? asked Maya. You're terribly exciting. Why, everybody knows who I am, said the green oddity, and grinned almost beyond the limits of his jaws. Maya never could make out whether he spoke in fun or in earnest. I'm a stranger in these parts, she replied pleasantly, else I'm sure I'd know you. But please note that I belong to the family of bees and am positively not a wasp. My goodness, said the grasshopper, one and the same thing. Maya couldn't utter a sound. She was so excited. You're uneducated, she burst out at length. Take a good look at a wasp once. Why should I? answered the green one. What good would it do if I observed differences that exist only in people's imagination? You, a bee, fly around in the air, sting everything you come across, and can't hop. Exactly the same with a wasp. So where's the difference? Hoppity hop! And he was gone. 
"'But now I am going to fly away,' thought Maya. "'There he was again. "'Mademoiselle,' he called, "'there's going to be a hopping match tomorrow. "'It will be held in the Reverend Sinpeck's garden. "'Would you care to have a complimentary ticket and watch the games? "'My old woman has two left over. "'She'll trade you one for a compliment. "'I expect to break the record.' "'I'm not interested in hopping acrobatics,' said Maya in some disgust. "'A person who flies has higher interests.' The grasshopper grinned a grin you could almost hear. "'Don't think too highly of yourself, my dear young lady. "'Most creatures in this world can fly, but only a very, very few can hop. "'You don't understand other people's interests. "'You have no vision.' "'Even human beings would like a great, elegant hop. "'The other day I saw the Reverend Sinpeck hop a yard up into the air "'to impress a little snake that slid across his road. "'His contempt for anything that couldn't hop was so great "'that he threw away his pipe. "'And reverends, you know, cannot live without their pipes. "'I have known grasshoppers, members of my own family, "'who could hop to a height three hundred times their length. "'Now you're impressed.' "'You haven't a word to say, and you're inwardly regretting the remarks you made and the remarks you intended to make. Three hundred times their own length. Just imagine. Even the elephant, the largest animal in the world, can't hop as high as that. Well, you're not saying anything. Didn't I tell you you wouldn't have anything to say?' "'But how can I say anything if you don't give me a chance?' "'All right, then. Talk.' said the grasshopper pleasantly. Hoppity hop! He was gone. Maya had to laugh in spite of her irritation. The fellow had certainly furnished her with a strange experience. Buffoon though he was, still she had to admire his wide information and worldly wisdom, and though she could not agree with his views of hopping, she was amazed by all the new things he had taught her in their brief conversation. If he had been more reliable, she would have been only too glad to ask him questions about a number of different things. It occurred to her that often people who are least equipped to profit by experiences are the very ones who have them. He knew the names of human beings. Did he then understand their language? If he came back, she'd ask him. And she'd also ask him what he thought of trying to go near a human being or of entering a human being's house. "'Mademoiselle!' A blade of grass beside Maya was set swaying. "'Goodness gracious, where do you keep coming from?' "'The surroundings.' "'But do tell, do you hop out into the world just so, without knowing where you mean to land?' "'Of course, why not? Can you read the future? No one can, only the tree toad. But he never tells.' "'The things you know. Wonderful. Simply wonderful. "'Do you understand the language of human beings?' "'That's a difficult question to answer, mademoiselle, "'because it hasn't been proved as yet whether human beings have a language. "'Sometimes they utter sounds by which they seem to reach an understanding with each other. "'But such awful sounds! So unmelodious! "'Like nothing else in nature that I know of. "'However,' There's one thing you must allow them. They do seem to try to make their voices pleasanter. Once I saw two boys take a blade of grass between their thumbs and blow on it. The result was a whistle which may be compared with the chirping of a cricket, though far inferior in quality of tone, far inferior. However, human beings make an honest effort. Is there anything else you'd like to ask? I know a thing or two. He grinned his almost audible grin. But the next time he hopped off, Maya waited for him in vain. She looked about in the grass and the flowers. He was nowhere to be seen. End of chapter 5 That was chapter 5, The Adventures of Maya the Bee by Waldemar Bonsells. And it's a very story-telling episode of the Secret Kindergarten Radio today. 
we are going to listen to some of Aesop's fables. Here we go. Let's do it. The Farmer and the Stork A farmer set some traps in a field which he had lately sown with corn, in order to catch the cranes which came to pick up the seed. When he returned to look at his traps, he found several cranes caught, and among them a stork, which begged to be let go, and said, You are not to kill me! I'm not a crane, but a stork, as you can easily see by my feathers, and I am the most honest and harmless of birds. But the farmer replied, It's nothing to me what you are. I find you among these cranes who ruin my crops, and like them you shall suffer. The moral of the story is that if you choose bad companions, no one will believe that you are anything but bad yourself. The Charger and the Miller A horse, who had been used to carry his rider into battle, felt himself growing old, and chose to work in a mill instead. He now no longer found himself stepping out proudly to the beating of the drums, but was compelled to slave away all day grinding the corn. Bewailing his hard lot, he said one day to the miller, Ah, me! I was once a splendid war-horse, gaily caparisoned, and attended by a groom whose sole duty was to see to my wants. How different is my present condition! I wish I had never given up the battlefield for the mill. The miller replied with asperity, It's no use you regretting the past. Fortune has many ups and downs. You must take them as they come. The Grasshopper and the Owl An owl who lived in a hollow tree was in the habit of feeding by night and sleeping by day. But her slumbers were greatly disturbed by the chirping of a grasshopper who had taken up his abode in the branches. She begged him repeatedly to have some consideration for her comfort. But the grasshopper, if anything, only chirped the louder. At last the owl could stand it no longer but determined to rid herself of the pest by means of a trick. Addressing herself to the grasshopper, she said in her pleasantest manner, As I cannot sleep for your song, which, believe me, it's as sweet as the notes of Apollo's lyre, I have a mind to taste some nectar, which Minerva gave me the other day. Won't you come in and join me? The grasshopper was flattered by the praise of his song, and his mouth too watered at the mention of the delicious drink, so he said he would be delighted. No sooner had he got inside the hollow where the owl was sitting than she pounced upon him and ate him up. The Grasshopper and the Ants one fine day in winter, some ants were busy drying their store of corn, which had got rather damp during a long spell of rain. Presently up came a grasshopper, and begged them to spare her a few grains. For, she said, I'm simply starving. The ants stopped work for a moment, though this was against their principles. May we ask, said they, what you were doing with yourself all last summer? Why didn't you collect a store of food for the winter? The fact is, replied the grasshopper, I was so busy singing that I hadn't the time. If you spent the summer singing, replied the ants, you can't do better than spend the winter dancing. And they chuckled and went on with their work. The Farmer and the Viper one winter a farmer found a viper, frozen and numb with cold, and out of pity picked it up and placed it in his bosom. The viper was no sooner revived by the warmth than it turned upon its benefactor and inflicted a fatal bite upon him. And as the poor man lay dying, he cried, I have only got what I deserved for taking compassion on so villainous a creature. The moral of the story is that kindness is thrown away upon the evil. The Two Frogs Two frogs were neighbours. One lived in a marsh where there was plenty of water which frogs love. The other lived in a lane some distance away where all the water to be had was that which lay in the ruts after rain. 
The marsh frog warned his friend and pressed him to come and live with him in the marsh, for he would find his quarters there far more comfortable, and what was still more important, more safe. But the other refused, saying that he could not bring himself to move from a place to which he had become accustomed. A few days afterwards a heavy wagon came down the lane, and he was crushed to death under the wheels. The Cobbler Turned Doctor A very unskilful cobbler, finding himself unable to make a living at his trade, gave up mending boots and took to doctoring instead. He gave out that he had the secret of a universal antidote against all poisons, and acquired no small reputation, thanks to his talent for puffing himself up. One day, however, he fell very ill, and the king of the country bethought him that he would test the value of his remedy. Calling, therefore, for a cup, he poured out a dose of the antidote, and, under pretense of mixing poison with it, added a little water, and commanded the cobbler to drink it. Terrified by the fear of being poisoned, the cobbler confessed that he knew nothing about medicine and that his antidote was worthless. Then the king summoned his subjects and addressed them as follows. What folly could be greater than yours? Here is the cobbler to whom no one will send his boots to be mended, and yet you have not hesitated to entrust him with your lives. THE ASS, THE COCK, AND THE LION An ass and a cock were in a cattle pen together. Presently a lion, who had been starving for days, came along and was just about to fall upon the ass and make a meal of him, when the cock, rising to his full height and flapping his wings vigorously, uttered a tremendous crow. Now, if there is one thing that frightens a lion, it is the crowing of a cock and this one had no sooner heard the noise than he fled. The ass was mightily elated at this, and thought that, if the lion couldn't face a cock, he would be still less likely to stand up to an ass. So he ran out and pursued the lion. But when the two had got well out of sight and hearing of the cock, the lion suddenly turned upon the ass and ate him up. The moral of the story being that false confidence often leads to disaster. The Belly and the Members The members of the body once rebelled against the belly. You, they said to the belly, live in luxury and sloth and never do a stroke of work, while we not only have to do all the hard work there is to be done, but are actually your slaves and have to minister to all your wants. Now we will do so no longer, and you can shift for yourself in the future. They were as good as their word, and left the belly to starve. The result was just what might have been expected. The whole body soon began to fail, and the members and all shared in the general collapse. And then they saw too late how foolish they had been. The Bald Man and the Fly a fly settled on the head of a bald man and bit him. In his eagerness to kill it, the bald man hit himself a smart slap, but the fly escaped, and said to him in derision, You tried to kill me for just one little bite. What will you do to yourself now for the heavy smack you've just given yourself? Oh, for that blow I bear no grudge, he replied, for I never intended myself any harm. But as for you, you contemptible insect, who live by sucking human blood, I'd have borne a good deal more than that for the satisfaction of dashing the life out of you. The Ass and the Wolf An ass was feeding in a meadow, and, catching sight of his enemy the wolf in the distance, pretended to be very lame and hobbled painfully along. When the wolf came up, he asked the ass how he came to be so lame and the ass replied that in going through a hedge he had trodden on a thorn, and he begged the wolf to pull it out with his teeth. "'In case,' said the ass, "'when you eat me, it should stick in your throat and hurt you very much.' The wolf said he would, and told the ass to lift up his foot, and then gave his whole mind to getting out the thorn. But the ass suddenly let out with his heels and fetched the wolf a fearful kick in the mouth, breaking all his teeth. 
and then he galloped off at full speed. As soon as he could speak, the wolf growled to himself, Ah, it serves me right. My father taught me to kill, and I ought to have stuck to that tree instead of attempting to cure. The Monkey and the Camel At a gathering of all the beasts, the monkey gave an exhibition of dancing and entertained the company vastly. There was great applause at the finish, which excited the envy of the camel, and made him desire to win the favour of the assembly by the same means. So he got up from his place and began dancing, but he cut such a ridiculous figure as he plunged about and made such a grotesque exhibition of his ungainly person that the beasts all fell upon him with ridicule and drove him away. THE SICK MAN AND THE DOCTOR A sick man received a visit from his doctor, who asked him how he was. "'Fairly well, doctor,' said he, "'but I find I sweat a great deal.' "'Ah,' said the doctor, "'that's a good sign.' On his next visit, he asked the same question, and his patient replied, "'I'm much as usual, but I've taken to having shivering fits, which leave me cold all over.' "'Ah,' said the doctor, that's a good sign, too. When he came the third time and inquired, as before, about his patient's health, the sick man said that he felt very feverish. A very good sign, said the doctor. You are doing very nicely indeed. Afterwards, a friend came to see the invalid, and on asking him how he did, received this reply. My dear friend, I'm dying of good signs. Welcome back to the Secret Kindergarten. Let's play some music. Let's stand up and get moving. Put your arms down by your sides. Don't bend your knees. Don't bend at all. We're going to do the penguin waddle and walk now. Start your walk and stay straight and tall. We're doing the penguin the mountains 
wings fly out over the sea Come home, little bird, you must be tired And I have food for thee Fly, little bird, across the mountains Fly out over the sea Come home, little bird, you must be tired
white with snow Says the hummingbird I fly through the darkness of night Often resting for it's such a long flight I fly away I fly away Songbird, I miss you every winter when you go Before the leaves are off the trees And the ground is white with snow Says the songbird, don't worry, I'll return in the spring And I'll sit outside your window and sing safely till you bring me back your song I fly away I fly away I fly away I will listen for your song when you return on a warm spring Watch it grow, soon we will have a veg- 
vegetable. This one's orange and rabbits like to eat it. It's a carrot. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. This one grows under the ground, and when it's ready to eat, you have to dig it up. It's a potato. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. You might call this one little trees because it looks like little trees. It's broccoli. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. This one's long and yellow, and sometimes we pop it. It's corn. Plant a little seed, watch it grow. Soon we will have a vegetable. This one's round and green, and we call it a head. It's a head of lettuce. So that was a whole bunch of music by Nancy Stewart from nancymusic.com. Now I'm going to read you a little story. And this story is called Where the Wild Things Are. And I used to have this story read to me when I was a young child. So here we go. The night Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind and another. His mother called him wild thing and max said i'll eat you up so he was sent to bed without eating anything that very night in max's room a forest grew and grew and grew until his ceiling hung with vines and the walls became the world all around. And an ocean tumbled by with a private boat for Max. And he sailed off through night and day. And in and out of weeks. And almost over a year to where the wild things are. And when he came to the place where the wild things are, they roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws. Till Max said, Be still! And tamed them with the magic trick of staring into all their yellow eyes without blinking once. And they were frightened and called him the most wild thing of all and made him king of all wild things. And now, cried Max, let the wild rumpus start. Now stop. Max said, and sent the wild things off to bed without their supper. And Max, the king of all wild things, was lonely. And wanted to be where someone loved him best of all. Then all around from far away, across the world, he smelled good things to eat. So he gave up being king of where the wild things are. But the wild things cried, Oh, please don't go! We'll eat you up! We love you so! And Max said, No! The wild things roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws. 
But Max stepped into his private boat and waved goodbye. And sailed back over a year, and in and out of weeks, and through a day, and into the night of his very own room, where he found his supper waiting for him. And it was still hot. And that's one of my favorite stories for young children. And let's play some more music before we go to the end of the show. This one's called There's a Little Wheel A Turning in My Heart. There's a little wheel a turning in my heart. There's a little wheel a turning in my heart. In my heart, in my heart. There's a little wheel a turning in my heart. There's a little bell a ringing in my heart. There's a little bell. In my heart, in my heart, there's a little bell a ringing in my heart. There's a little song a singing in my heart. There's a little song a singing in my heart. In my heart, in my heart, there's a little song a singing. I feel so very happy in my heart. Oh, I feel so very happy in my heart. In my heart, in my heart. Oh, I feel so very happy in my heart. There's a little wheel a turning in my heart. There's a little wheel a turning. In my heart, in my heart, there's a little wheel a turning in my heart. There's a little wheel a turning in my heart. I'm a little scallop in a shell down in the sand. I live quite. Come a knocking at my door. I'll close up tight, you won't see me anymore. Red and yellow make or and yellow make or and red and yellow make or red and yellow make or and red and yellow make. colors it's true and it only takes two to make another pretty color for you blue and yellow make green 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 that's the way the colors go red and yellow and blue make so many pretty colors it's true and it only takes two to make another pretty color for you. Every color that you see is made by mixing just these three. Red and yellow and blue. Red and yellow and blue. Red and blue make It's true, 
And it only takes two to make another pretty color for you. And it only takes two to make another pretty color for you. We're done, we're finished now. All done, we're finished now. We're done, all finished now. All done, we're finished now. All right, thanks so much for listening, everybody. And just remember if your mummy and daddy are thinking you're being ugly, or you're being a beast, you're being naughty, will you just be like Max and you go and be your beautiful self? Use your imagination and play. So I'm your host, Gino, The Secret Kindergarten. That was another episode, and we'll see you at the next one.